The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Overcoming GVHD is the Key to Better HCT Outcomes, Guidance on Managing Acute and Chronic Disease. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CJR860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for coming to the symposium called Overcoming GVHD is the Key to Better Transplant Outcomes. Uh, so my name is Stephanie Lee, and I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Corey Cutler and uh, Miguel Perales. So the goals for today are to review the evidence supporting modern and emerging therapeutics for prophylaxis and treatment of graft versus host disease, and to provide you with our insights on integrating innovative therapies into strategies for preventing and treating graft versus host disease, including in steroid refractory treatment settings. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to invite Dr. Perales to the stage. Dr. Perales comes from Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, and he's the chief of the Adult Bone Marrow Transplantation Service. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you here uh, bright and early. And so uh, my task today is to review uh, acute GVHD, both prevention and treatment. Um, as we were talking about earlier, I think uh, a few years ago, we probably could have had the whole session in about 10 minutes. But the good news now for our patients is that we have many drugs, and I think we'll barely fit the whole topic into the session. So obviously, I think uh, a lot has evolved uh, over the last a couple of decades in terms of our understanding of what the targets are for treatment and prophylaxis of GVHD. And based on our better understanding of the biology, we've actually been able to develop new drugs and new therapeutic agents uh, to try and better prevent and treat uh, both acute and chronic GVHD as your hair. And I think it's, uh, it's very hard to speak today about the progress we've made in, uh, in the prevention of GVHD without uh, recognizing the work that the BMTCTN has done in this field, namely with the PROGRESS trials. And we have now completed three large uh, multi-center uh, national studies, and including one study that had international patients, looking at different strategies to prevent uh, acute and chronic GVHD, both in the reduced intensity setting and in the um, myeloblative setting. And so this slide depicts the results of BMTCTN 1203, which was PROGRESS-1, which was a randomized uh, pick-the-winner study comparing different strategies to prevent uh, acute GVHD and chronic GVHD in the setting of uh, reduced intensity allograft. And the strategies uh, tested here was a control arm from the CABMTR, uh, tacrolimus MMF with post-transplant cyclophosphamide based on work done at Johns Hopkins, tacrolimus methotrexate, and um, uh, botezomib based on work done at uh, the Faber, and then uh, tacrolimus methotrexate and meribaroc based on work done uh, by uh, Ran Reshef. And you can see that in this study, the winner was a post-transplant cyclophosphamide, and this was then moved forward to the next uh, study, which was BMTCTN 1703, or PROGRESS-3. And this study was presented as a late breaker abstract uh, at ASH uh, just a few weeks ago, and is currently under review for publication. This was a phase three randomized trial comparing two approaches now, the reduced intensity transplant with a seven of eight or eight of eight donor, and tacrolimus MMF with POSI versus standard care tacrolimus methotrexate. And all patients received peripheral blood stem cells. Um, this is the primary endpoint, and this was a positive trial. There was a significant difference in uh, the one-year endpoint of GRIFS, which is graft versus host disease relapse-free survival, which incorporates uh, moderate to severe, um, it incorporates grades three to four acute GVHD and moderate to severe chronic GVHD, as well as relapse. And you can see the, the hazard ratio here. This is looking at the data from the same trial, looking at uh, GVHD-free survival, again in favor of the post site arm. And importantly, there was no difference in relapse uh, between the two groups. So there has been additional work uh, using post site in the reduced intensity setting, also looking at mismatched unrelated donors. The uh, CIBMTR published a study in JCO, the 15 mismatch MUD study with bone marrow and POSI, showing really excellent results in those patients as well. And there's currently an ongoing access trial looking at reduced intensity and myeloblative uh, transplants with 
patients who have uh, mismatched unrelated donors and are receiving post-transplant cyclophosphamide based GVHD prophylaxis, and that study is ongoing. This is a publication from last year, which is a collaboration between uh, MSK, um, Brian Schaefer, our center, and Antonio Jimenez Jimenez at University of Miami, comparing retrospective data looking at mismatched unrelated donors who received either a prevention with the addition of ATG or with post-transplant cyclophosphamide. And you can see a significant advantage to the use of post sign this patient population. So I think by and large, uh, most people have abandoned the use of ATG in the mismatched and related donor setting. So moving on now to um, other options. This is data uh, with Abatacep, which is CTLA4IG. And this is work that has been led uh, in large part by Leslie Keane, uh, who's currently at Boston Children's. And um, these studies that I'm showing on this slide actually led to FDA approval of Batacept in this setting. And basically, two different studies were conducted. On the left, I'm showing a single arm uh, phase two trial in recipients of a seven of eight uh, donor. And on the right, a randomized phase two trial comparing uh, the addition of a Batacept to standard of care in eight of eight donors. And you can see in both studies, there's a, a significant improvement in the uh, uh, severe GVHD free survival. And the control arm in the 7 of 8 study was a uh, registry data from the CIBMT arm. And so I think there's you know, many interesting points to the study. One, obviously, it led to FDA approval, but I think it's also one of the first times that we've seen approval based on the systemic control arm from the registry. And so I think from a you know, clinical trial development, it's an important uh, consideration as well. And I think most of us would agree that given the known uh, and decreased survival in patients receiving a seven of eight donor with standard of care approaches that it would have been unethical to do a randomized study in this setting. And these are some of the other uh, data's, data results from that study. On the left, non-relapse mortality. In the middle, relapse-free survival. And on the right, overall survival. And you can see the advantage here of uh, using a Batacept in addition to standard of care tacrolimus methotrexate in the seven of eight uh, recipients. So what about uh, in the ablative setting? This is uh, PROGRESS-2, which was a, a randomized phase three trial comparing three different strategies. And this was published uh, by Leo Lesnick, Marcel Pesquini, uh, Vince Ho from uh, the Faber and myself uh, last year. And the three uh, arms in this study were tacrolimus methotrexate with bone marrow, which we consider the standard of care based on the original CTN trial comparing bone marrow to PBSC. The second arm was, uh, the, one of the experimental arms was bone marrow post-transplant cyclophosphamide alone. And the third arm was C34 selection of a, a PBSC graft. And this study accrued um, over 300 patients. And this study, um, unlike PROGRESS C, was actually a negative result in terms of the primary endpoint, which was CRIS, which is chronic GVHD relapse free survival. And you can see there was no significant difference between the three arms. On the right, I'm showing the overall survival, and the lower arm, unfortunately for uh, myself and, and investigators at MSK, is actually the C34 selected arm. So there was decreased overall survival in these patients. So let's look at some of the other endpoints to try to understand this data. On the left is chronic GVHD, on the right is transplant-related mortality. The lower arm here on chronic GVHD arm is, is C34 selection, so you can see that the use of the C34 selected graft or ex vivo T cell depletion, which has a very low T cell content in the graft, results in a significant reduction in chronic GVHD. However, if you look at transplant related mortality, the upper curve is actually the C34 selected arm. So, where we have a significant reduction in both acute and chronic GVHD, uh, we do see increased transplant related mortality. There was no significant difference in relapse. The lower curve in red is actually the post site arm, but this does not reach statistical significance. But obviously, as I showed you already on the overall survival curves, there was decreased overall uh, relapse-free survival as well in C34 selection. And this was driven really by toxicity. So we've done quite a bit of work at MSK to try and understand this data, and actually we've been uh, working now for several years trying to improve the C34 selection platform, recognizing that one of the main uh, disadvantages of that approach is really the increased risk of infections related to the late immune recovery. 
And, and part of the package in the C34 selected arm, in addition to the radiation and chemotherapy or the chemotherapy-based regimen, is the use of rabbit ATG. And what we've recognized is that the timing and the dose of ATG, as we've been doing it historically, which is weight-based, uh, may be suboptimal. And this is work done by, um, by JJ Bullens and colleagues at MSK looking at uh, PK modeling of ATG dosing. And what we've identified is basically a sweet spot in terms of too little ATG may lead to uh, increased rejection, but too much ATG clearly leads to decreased survival and increased uh, transplant-related mortality due to complications. And so now we have an ongoing study where we've basically moved up the ATG prior to the conditioning regimen, and we're using a normogram to dose the ATG based on the patient's weight as well as the absolute lymphocyte count. Because we know that patients coming into transplant based on the prior therapy may have different uh, ALCs, and the ALC basically is a sink for ATG, and so that may impact the ultimate dose of ATG at the time that the graph goes in. So more to come, and I hope uh, that we will be able to share data maybe on next year's tandem, uh, looking at improvements in the, the C34 selected platform based on this work. But the other way to think about C34 selection is really as a platform for graft engineering, because this is an approach where really there is no post-transplant immune suppression. So this is the ideal setting to then do T cell addbacks or add back other cell populations. And I'm just gonna give you here a few slides, sort of a glimpse into the future of what C34 selection could be and is actually currently being developed. So this study is a study that's currently open at MSK. It's uh, led by a company called Smart Immune, which is a French company based on work done uh, in France by Maria Cavazano and colleagues. And basically what they've been able to do, and, and this is work that we've also replicated in Marcel van der Brink's lab, is to generate pro-lymphocytes, uh, ex vivo, using notch signaling and a combination of cytokines, including high doses of IL-7. And so essentially what you're doing, you're generating a pre-immune system ex vivo, and then you can infuse that into the patient, and the T cells then develop within the patient. And so by developing within the patient, they actually are tolerant to the patient. So the notion here is that you would infuse these pro-lymphocytes about eight to 10 days uh, after the C34 selected graph, and that would give you a first wave of immune recovery, which would then be followed by immune recovery coming from the graft. And we think that this may result in better clinical outcomes with decreased infections. So we've actually already treated the first patient at MSK with this approach, and uh, we don't really have long-term follow-up yet, but I can tell you that the patient in graft is without any complications. And importantly, uh, currently, almost two months out from transplant, doesn't have, have any evidence of graft versus host disease despite having received this early infusion of allo uh, pro-lymphocytes from her same donor. So another approach that uh, is a study that we also have open at uh, MSK is a, a study based uh, on work done uh, uh, with Vivor Biome. And here what they've done is they're um, gene editing out CD33 from the graft. And so they're taking a C34 selected graft using CRISPR to knock out a CD33 and infusing then a CD33 negative a C34 selected graft in the patient. And obviously the advantage here is that you can then in patients with mild malignancies who are either high risk or maybe even have residual disease that you could come in early with a CD33 targeted approach uh, such as uh, Mylotog in this case to try and eliminate any residual disease and the graft itself is actually resistant to CD33 uh, targeted therapy since it uh, no longer expresses CD33. So this is a preliminary data that was, uh, uh, is publicly available. I will refer you to uh, an additional uh, poster tomorrow evening which uh, will have additional data on this study. But this is the first patient and you can see the timeline of neutrophil recovery on the left and platelet recovery on the right. And, and this is very typical for what we see in C34 selected grafts, which are PBSC grafts, pretty early uh, uh, engraftment. So the deletion of C33 did not have any impact on engraftment. And then this is looking at uh, the follow-up in this patient who was then treated with a uh, gemtuzumab um, after several cycles. And you can see that the, the counts on the left are very stable. Um, and, and also with some flow cytometry data, they've been able to show that basically there is no C33 component uh, in this graft, but the cells um, are, are perfectly fine. 
So I think this is a very interesting approach. Obviously, this is early data, and as I said, there'll be more data uh, later at the meeting. And the third approach to graft engineering is work done um, by Orca Bio, which is a company that is based on work done at uh, Stanford by Rob Neglin and colleagues. And, um, you know, Rob and his colleagues have spent a lot of time working on regulatory T cells. And so I've identified the ability of regulatory T cells to modulate immune responses in the post-transplant setting. And in this uh, uh, approach, what they're doing is infusing a C34 selected graft and when then combining that with different populations of T cells. And so they have affected T cells that they call T-con and regulatory T cells that they call T-reg. And by combining these two populations, what they hope to achieve and, and what their preliminary data shows is that you can have enhanced immune recovery uh, post-transplant in, in the C34 selected ex vivo T cell depleta setting without having an increase in graft versus host disease. And, and some of this work has already been presented by Everett Meyer, Ash, and there will also be uh, further presentations uh, at the meeting here today, I mean, um, this week. So this is some of the early data where they've combined uh, phase 1B data uh, from uh, Stanford as well as uh, multi-center experience uh, phase 2 data. And they're using a standard of care control, which is not a randomized trial, I'd like to point out. On the left, we're looking at uh, GVHD relapse free survival. And I, as I mentioned, this is combined data. You can see a significant improvement in the patients who receive the Orca T product. And on the right is almost survival with also a difference uh, compared to standard of care. And, and these are the acute and chronic GVHD incidences. And it's probably hard to see, but all the way at the bottom in green is both the acute on the left and on the right chronic GVHD uh, which have very low rates in this setting, even though you're infusing uh, early T cell products in these patients. So I think this is a very interesting approach. Uh, I've highlighted at the bottom of the slide the abstracts that will be presented on this topic. Um, and obviously, they're now moving forward with a phase three trial, uh, which is currently open. So let's switch now to uh, the treatment of acute GVHD. And uh, I think here, obviously, what we've recognized over time is that not every patient presenting with acute GVHD is the same. Historically, we've known that, based on the grading systems that we have, that patients with grade three to four GVHD do, GVHD do significantly worse, and, and grade one to two do better. But we've also recognized that even with patients with lower grades of GVHD, um, that some grade two GVHDs do very well, and some you know, look like they really have grade three GVHD. And so we currently have two approaches to try and better stratify these patients. And this is work done uh, in Minnesota by Maggie McMillan and colleagues um, using the Minnesota uh, or clinical staging for GVHD. And so based on the, the stage and the organ involvement and the number of organs, they've defined two uh, patient populations uh, in a cohort of more than 1,000 patients, those with standard risk and those with high risk. And on the left, we're looking at the day 28 response uh, to steroids. You can see that standard risk patients have a high response rate of almost 50% uh, complete remission rates and close to 70% uh, overall response rates. In contrast, the patients who have high risk disease, uh, which represents about uh, 20 to 25% of the cohort, have a CR rate of about half of that, around 27%, and the overall response rate um, is below 50%. So we already have here a good staging system to risk stratify patients. And importantly, if you look at the right panel, this is the survival at six months from diagnosis. You can see that the, the standard risk patients have a mortality rate of 22%, and that doubles in the high risk patients. So I think this really emphasizes the fact that even with the progress that we've made, we still have very, uh, a lot of work to be done in terms of reducing the mortality in these patients and, and finding better strategies to treat acute GVHD. And then the other approach uh, that was really led by uh, uh, Sophie Pazneshi, who's in the audience here today, uh, Jamie Farrar and John Levine, uh, when they were at Michigan and then has been further developed, is the use of biomarkers. And, and this is currently now uh, being used in the MAGIC Consortium, which is a combination of three markers, TNFR1, reg 3 alpha and ST2. And then based on that algorithm, you can identify Ann Arbor uh, risk patients and, and I think this is critical because particularly in, um, in the grade two GVHD, we, they were able to distinguish at the time of diagnosis patients who are gonna do well and patients who would do poorly. 
And so we can think again about you know, how to better treat these patients either by de-escalation uh, of therapy and reducing the, the use of steroids or getting rid of steroids completely uh, to avoid the toxicity, or in the higher risk patients start to think about escalating therapy up front. And so I think we're really moving to a new era where the upfront treatment of GVHD is changing um, based on either clinical certification or uh, biomarker-driven certification. And this is some of the additional uh, biomarker data in patients with clinical grade 2 GVHD. And you can see here the non-relapse mortality uh, changes significantly based on the Ann Arbor stage, um, and as well as the risk of uh, steroid resistance. I think this is really how we sort of think of, of managing GVHD in the modern era, certainly in the clinical trial setting. Um, I'd be happy to discuss in the Q&A what I think is the current uh, clinical implications for this in routine practice. So getting now back to the targets and, and what are some of the new strategies or ongoing strategies for treatment of acute GVHD. And so I just want to, you know, recognize what I call the, the golden oldies but goodies. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of work in this area over the years. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it was uh, not randomized data or single cent center series or cases, sometimes uh, prospective trials. And so there's a lot of data in the literature, um, but not necessarily uh, something that we can use. And so I'll refer you to this excellent uh, review from just a couple of years ago um, that really summarizes a lot of the data. So I think if you, if you have a patient that you're thinking about using one of these drugs, I will refer you at least to this publication because it really goes through all the, the drugs and the data supporting or not supporting their use in these patients. And you can see here, just as an example for alentuzumab, um, there's retrospective data, there's some phase two data, some of the other drugs, um, there's only retrospective data. Um, so one of the strategies that many people use in uh, acute as well as chronic GVHD is ECP. And this is some of the data supporting that. Again, you can see relatively small studies or retrospective data. Um, but there is ongoing uh, clinical trials uh, in this area as well in chronic and acute GVHD. And so I think uh, ECP is certainly something that is used at many centers. And I think there's ongoing work there to try and uh, establish it um, you know, in a more formal way as a therapeutic. And just to point out that at least in some countries, it's actually got regulatory approval, such as Australia and Japan for chronic GVHD. So I think more to come in the, in the ECP field. What about MSCs? Um, this is sort of the biology slide to remind everyone that in many ways, uh, MSCs is somewhat of a black box. Uh, we can do a lot of hand waving around what the biology is. And I think one of the challenges we've had in the field of MSCs is that different centers make their own MSCs differently with different starting materials and different uh, cytokine uh, conditions. And so it's been hard to have a standardized uh, MSCs. Um, this is a um, meta-analysis uh, published a few years ago that suggested that there was a benefit to MSCs. Again, looking at relatively small studies across the board. Uh, but I think many of you know that the randomized phase three trial that was done uh, ended up being a negative study. Um, the MSCs are approved in some countries, particularly in pediatrics, where the data seems more promising than in adults. So I know that in Canada, at least, I think it's used in pediatric patients. So what's new? Obviously, I think most of you are now familiar with uh, ruxolitinib. These are the results from the REACH-1 study, which was a, a phase two single-arm study of 79 patients performed in the US and led by Madan Jagesia. Uh, published in blood, and this led to approval of ruxolitinib in second line in the U.S. at least. And, and you can see here uh, the response rates which were seen across uh, different grades uh, as well as different organ systems. There's obviously, you know, as usual, better responses in the skin and gut than in the liver. I think many of us, um, you know, were surprised because this is an oral agent um, that we did see GI responses even in patients with significant diarrhea. Um, these results were then validated in the randomized uh, phase three trial that was published by Robert Zeiss in the New England Journal. And this was a study that was required for regulatory approval by the EMA in Europe. They have stricter criteria than us. And, and what was interesting is that the results of REACH3, which is a randomized trial comparing RUX to best available therapy, were very much in line with the phase two trial that we had done here in the US. And you can see here on the left the uh, overall response rates with CR rates uh, close to 30%. Um, and then the durability of response, obviously, there is a drop-off. But I think this 
is now very much established as a, as a second line therapy in the acute setting. Obviously, uh, many patients don't have adequate responses, adorable responses, so I think there's room to improve here. And this is uh, the loss of response data. You can see that uh, it's improved in the ruxolitinib arm uh, compared to the control arm on the left. And the failure-free survival, um, again, improves the ruxolitinib on the, on the right compared to the control. But I think most of us would agree that we do have room to improve on this, and there are ongoing studies. So another study is uh, another agent that we're looking at is alpha-1 antitrypsin. This is being looked at in the BMT-CTN in the upfront setting. And this is a BMT-CTN 1705. And this is based uh, on part on work done at uh, Michigan, uh, looking at the use of um, alpha-1 antitrypsin steroid refractory GVHD. And you can see here the, the rate of CR increases to a plateau of around 25% over time. And the overall response rates are over um, 50% uh, at day 28. And there are currently sort of two main studies of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. One is a prevention study, and the other one is the, the study I just mentioned in this BMTCTN. A couple of other agents uh, targeting CD6, which is an old drug which has made a comeback, or an old target which has made a comeback, and this is work that's been done uh, at the Dana-Farber in part, led by, uh, by Corey and colleagues. And you can see this is some of the early uh, data looking at uh, patients treated with uh, CD6 targeting. And they've looked at both steroid naive as well as uh, all patients. And you can see here interesting responses. Obviously, we're waiting to see more data as this evolves. And I'm out of time, so I will quickly mention a couple of other drugs. Uh, this is AL22, a work done at our center uh, by Doris Ponce and colleagues. And, and this is a drug which works both on the immune system and on the gut and is thought to be able to regenerate uh, the CRIPS, which is uh, one of the, you know, the important things of GVHD is that we have significant damage of the, the CRIPS and then that leads to sort of ongoing uh, clinical symptoms. And so we did a study in patients with lower GI GVHD in combination with, with steroids, and the study in this early stage study was positive, and now we're moving towards uh, probably a randomized trial. But you can see here the CR rates and, and overall response rates uh, which are quite encouraging. And then uh, one of the last drugs is a drug targeting the GLP-2 pathway. Uh, again, work led by uh, Robert Zeiser based on preclinical work that he's done and some early clinical work. This is a drug which is not an anti-inflammatory. This drug basically helps the restoration of the gut uh, mucosa and is being studied in both short bowel syndrome and now also in steroid refractory QGVHD. And, and this is some of the clinical data supporting that uh, that was generated by, by Robert Zeiser. And, and this is a current uh, clinical trial. So in this setting, we're really, what we're trying to do is, you know, in combination with ruxolitinib, which we hope to be um, you know, based on the results of ruxolitinib as an anti-inflammatory through JAK1, JAK2 inhibition, is to add uh, apraglutide to help regenerate the gut. And so the primary endpoint here is actually going to be a bit further out. It's with, what we're trying to do is lift that uh, response curve and maintain the durability of response that is seen with ruxolitinib through the restoration of normal gut mucosa. So this study is open and hope, hope to have results next year. So some quick take-home points. We all know that steroid refractory acute GVHD is bad. This is a drug versus control, and survival is bad in both settings. Um, I always like to refer you to a quote by Dan Weisdorf from uh, 2016, and, and this is based on, on work that uh, Claudia Nesseli and then, and then uh, Stephanie Lee did subsequently in the randomized trial, that the use of bone marrow for peripheral blood in much related donors and much related donor transplants will have a bigger impact on chronic GVHD than any small molecule that we have to treat it. And so to remind everyone that prevention, prevention, prevention is really the key. And finally, I think I've shown you very quickly that we do have new drugs that are effective in our patients. And so I do think we're seeing improvements over the last decade, and, and I hope to see more of that. And a reminder that a clinical trial is always a great option for patients with acute GVHD, either in prevention, in treatment, or in treatment of steroid refractory. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Perales. That was really a whirlwind. We're going to hold questions until the end, so we're going to switch now to chronic graft-versus-host disease, and then Dr. Cutler is going to bring it home by trying to put it all together. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is go through the evidence supporting the FDA-approved drugs for second and later line therapy, and then talk a little bit about the studies for frontline therapy. So as you know, there are now three FDA-approved agents uh, for chronic graft-versus-host disease. Abrutinib was approved about five and a half years ago for adults and just last year for children. As we know, it's an ITK and BTK inhibitor, and so it, uh, decreased, it inhibits both B cells and T cells. Belomosidil was approved in 2021. It's a ROC2 inhibitor, and so by uh, inhibiting ROC2 here, it decreases STAT3 signaling and increases STAT5. As a consequence of that, it inhibits TH17 cells and follicular helper T cells and also increases regulatory T cells. It also has antifibrotic properties. And ruxolitinib, as we know, was a JAK1-2 inhibitor. It was also approved in 2021 for ages 12 and up, and it was approved uh, last year by the EMA. Um, by inhibiting uh, STAT1 and 3, it also decreases TH17 cells and increases regulatory T cells and also will have effects on fibrosis. And so the NCCN guidelines show us that these three agents, of course, show up in our armamentarium, but let's not forget all the other agents, which are not FDA approved, but that we also find ourselves using, and some of those are just listed here. So what I'd like to do is go through the studies that led to these regulatory approvals. I'll talk about the two, the, abrut the original abrutinib study published by Dr. Miklos, the update by Dr. Waller, and then uh, the pediatric study uh, um, by Dr. Carpenter. We'll go through the REACH-3 study, and then we'll talk about the two Velomosidil trials. And so I'd like to start with the, uh, the ones that were targeted more towards adult. I say adult, but it really was ages 12 and up. We'll be talking about the Abrutinib study, the REACH-3 study, and then the, uh, the Rockstar study. So in terms of the Abrutinib study, remember that this was a phase 1-2 study. It was single arm, and it was open label compared to historical controls. REACH-3, however, was a randomized phase 3, although it was open label, and it was comparing ruxolitinib to best available therapy, and there were 10 best available therapies that you could choose. Belomosodil was a randomized phase 2, open label, two different doses, and it was compared to historical controls. The abrutinib and the belomosodil study, their primary endpoint was the best overall response rate, and in the ruxolitinib study, it was overall response rate at a specific time point, which was 24 weeks. There were, of course, lots of secondary endpoints, but all three of these studies looked at duration of response, the steroid dose reduction, and the change in symptoms. The key inclusion criteria did differentiate these studies. Abrutinib was uh, designed for patients who had failed one to three prior therapies. They also had to have evidence of inflammation. So they had to have erythema more than 25% of their body surface area or an oral mucosal score greater than four. So that's not a large population of chronic graft versus host disease. Ruxolitinib was designed as second-line therapy, so you had to have failed one prior line of therapy. And Belomosodil allowed patients on if they had failed two or five prior lines, two to five prior lines. Some notes is that the REACH-3 study allowed crossover from best available therapy to ruxolitinib at six months, so I think that affected some of the results. And the Belomosodil study excluded patients who had uh, advanced lung disease. In my opinion, the Ibrutinib study was the least uh, rigorous study because it was a single arm, uh, relatively small trial. The REACH-3 study was the uh, most rigorous study. It was a randomized study and very large. And the Belomosodil study was of in intermediate rigor. The pediatric study uh, was designed for patients who were ages 1 through 12, and this was a single arm study in which the primary endpoint was actually PK and safety, and the comparison was the adult PK results. It was very similar otherwise to the adult abrutinib study. So now I'm moving up. Here's the pediatric results with abrutinib, the adult uh, results with abrutinib, and then REACH3 and Belomosidil. Here we look at the number of patients. There were 42 in the adult study. There were 47 in the relapsed refractory chronic GVHD pediatric study. REACH-3 was very large, with 165 being treated by RUX, and then the Belomosidil study was also large, 132. The median age of the adult studies was around 50, 
uh, was 13 in the pediatric study. And the median time since diagnosis, here again you can see the distinction between the studies, REACH-3 was only six months uh, median on uh, enrollment since the diagnosis of chronic GVHD, whereas ibrutinib was intermediate at 14 and 16, and belomosidil was longest at 29 months. Uh, severe chronic graft versus host disease, uh, with these studies were all designed for patients who had moderate to severe, uh, so it was pretty high. And the median number of organs in the Belomosidil trial was the highest at four, and was two in the Abrutinib study. Actually, I didn't find it for the, uh, for the other two studies. The median prior lines of therapy, again, REACH-3 uh, was really designed as second-line therapy. Uh, for the Abrutinib studies, the, they had a median of two prior lines, and then Belomosidil was a median of three prior lines. Uh, and if you look at the patients who had prior abrutinib and roxalitinib, you can see it was very low uh, in all of these studies, but actually in the belomosidil trial, about 30% of patients had been previously exposed to abrutinib or to roxalitinib. And so and if we look at these study populations, REACH-3 really was designed for a pretty early population, Abru the abrutinib studies for an intermediate population, and I say inflammatory here because that was part of the uh, eligibility criteria. And if you look at the patients in the Bellamosidil study, they were more advanced and there was a lot of fibrotic disease. If we look at study results, actually the results are pretty similar. So if we just look first at the abrutinib study, the ruxolitinib study, and the belomosidil study, you can see that the best overall response rate was high. It was all in the 70s. Um, here, the median follow-up was about a year, and with the extended abrutinib study, it was about two years. The CR rate was actually quite high in the abrutinib study, but remember, it's a fairly small study and fairly uh, inflammatory disease. Um, you can see that the CR rate was, was pretty low. It's mostly par partial responses. Um, and then in terms of the overall response rate, that was the primary endpoint of the REACH study. It was about 50%. It was also quite good in the pediatric abrutinib study. Duration of responses, in, in my opinion, were actually pretty long. Um, they were at different time points. It's a little hard to, to interpret, um, but they looked like they were over 50% at 12 or 18 months. And the failure-free survival was similarly long. Symptom response, there were 24% of patients in the Brutinib study who had a clinically meaningful response, 24% uh, but at a time point of, uh, in the REACH study, and then 61% in the Bellamosidil study, but that was best overall, best response, best symptom response. If you look at the Abrutinib study, it had very high response rates in the skin and the mouth, but again, remember, that was part of the eligibility criteria, and otherwise, I think they were fairly similar uh, in the pediatric Abrutinib study and the Rux and the, the Bellamosidil study. If you look at toxicity, uh, there were a lot of uh, grade three and above adverse events that were reported in all three studies, but the spectrum differed. So if you look at these grade three or higher adverse events that occurred in more than 10% of the population, for brutinib, you can see it's pneumonia, fatigue, and diarrhea with also a lot of infections reported. For the pediatric abrutinib study, it was fever. Uh, in ruxolitinib, as expected, there were cytopenias and actually none in the Bellamosidil study that reached this, this criteria. So again, in my opinion, in terms of risk of complications, I think it's less in the Bolomosidil study, intermediate in the ruxolitinib study, and a little bit more in the abrutinib study. So if we look at the FDA approvals for patients who are second and greater line therapy, we can see that abrutinib is approved for ages one and above for uh, second or greater line therapy. Ruxolitinib is approved for ages 12 and up for second or greater line therapy. And Bellamosidil is also approved for ages 12 and up, but in third line and later therapy. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to frontline therapy and uh, talk about the three uh, that I think are relevant. The first one that is now online, uh, the uh, Integrate study, the Abrutinib study. Uh, we'll talk about the fairly small number of patients, pediatric patients who were reported uh, by Dr. Carpenter. And then just in this last ASH, uh, Dr. M, um, uh, reported the uh, itacitinib study. And itacitinib is a JAK1 inhibitor. And here are the trial designs. So the integrate study, the abrutinib study, was a randomized phase three double blind study of patients who were 12 and up. And in this trial, patients, all patients who had moderate to severe chronic GVHD, previously untreated, received steroids with either abrutinib or placebo. Really is the gold standard kind of study. In the IMAGINE study, this was part of the uh, other report. Um, it was a fairly small single arm study compared to historical controls. And in the GRAVITAS 309 study, looking at itacitinib, it was a randomized phase one, two, open label for ages 12 and up, 
And this, well, everybody got steroids, and then they had different doses of it in Sitnip. And, and to be fair, this was really not designed to be a comparative study. It was really a dose-finding study. Uh, the steroid dose was between 0.5 and 1 for all of the trials. They did have different endpoints reflecting their design. So the uh, integrate study, the primary endpoint uh, with the rutinib study was overall response rate at week 48. The IMAGINE study was uh, PK and safety. It was a pediatric study. And then in the uh, Gravitas study, it was incidence and severity of adverse events. Number of similar secondary endpoints. And the key inclusion criteria was that all patients had to have moderate to severe uh, chronic GVHD. And patients were excluded if they had received more than 72 hours of steroids in all three of the studies. In the itacitinib study, the 300 milligram BID arm, which was the highest dose arm, was stopped early. So again, in terms of study design, I think the abrutinib study had the highest rigor. Uh, the IMAGINE study, which was the pediatric study, low because, again, it was pediatrics. And then the uh, itacitinib study uh, was intermediate because really the goal was to find the, um, the uh, recommended phase 2 dose. So here are the study populations. Again, in integrate, a large study, so 95%, uh, 95 patients received abrutinib. Uh, Imagine study quite small, uh, 12 patients, and then the itacitinib study, uh, 103. In terms of the age, it was again similar in the adult study and, and low as expected in pediatrics. And the median time until chronic GBHD diagnosis was standard. It was about eight months. These were initial therapy studies, so we would expect the median time from diagnosis to treatment to be short. Um, and again, it was moderate to severe chronic GBHD, but most of the patients had moderate in the studies. The median number of organs was three in the ibrutinib study, um, was not actually reported in the abstracts in the other ones, and um, about half of patients when it was reported were on other immunosuppression. So again, here are the study results of the abrutinib uh, adult pediatric and itacitinib study. So if we look at the overall response rate at 48 uh, weeks, um, it actually was not different between the patients who received abrutinib plus steroids versus placebo plus steroids, not statistically significant. The overall response rate at six months was not also different. Uh, CR rate was low at 48 weeks, uh, but not different. Duration of response and median event-free survival, it did look like it was longer in the ibrutinib, but it was not statistically significant. And the improvement in symptoms was also um, a little bit higher in the patients who were randomized to ibrutinib, but not statistically significant. Mortality was similar in the two arms. If we look at the pediatric patients, again, remember only 12 patients in the study, but they actually looked uh, pretty like they did very well, and very low mortality and high response rates, as we might expect with pediatrics. And then when you look at the itacitinib study, these are the results for the 300 milligrams a day, 400 milligrams a day, and steroids only arm. You can see that there might have been a hint that there was slightly more response in the itacitinib arm, but again, not power to really look at that. CR rates uh, were um, shown here, and mortality was a little bit higher in the itacitinib arm. Um, if we look at toxicity, um, we can see that, again, grade three and higher events were reported to be pretty high. I will note that in the itacitinib study, which was open label, you can see that the grade three and, high, um, grade three and higher uh, toxicities were thir was 31% in the steroids only arm. In the abrutinib study, in which it was uh, double blinded, uh, in the placebo arm, which was essentially steroids alone, it was 67%. So I think this is why blinding, whenever you can do it, is extremely important because these patients, in theory, should have been comparable. If we look at the grade three and higher adverse events, uh, you can see that for abrutinib, it was insomnia, peripheral edema, and cough. Uh, in the pediatric study, it was increased liver function tests. And then in the itacitinib study, it was infections and cytopenias. So I think in terms of the risk of complications, it was pretty low in the pediatric study and intermediate in the itacitinib and the abrutinib arm. Uh, so just in summary, I think I've shown you there are several novel agents that are available for second line and later therapy. We've reviewed the data for abrutinib, bruxolitinib, and belomosidil, and I think that overall these are very well tolerated, but they are very expensive. Um, I do think that all of them are reasonable to try, uh, and we'll talk, uh, Dr. Cutler will address, you know, maybe some of the, the honing of which one to try, but I think all are reasonable. And the choice is often based on non-chronic GVHD, GVHD considerations. And I would say that the quest to improve first-line therapy continues, uh, but we keep trying.
So thank you for your attention. I'll ask Dr. Cutler to uh, come to the podium and to bring us home. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for waking up early to hear us speak this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, take a bit of an algorithmic approach to the issues uh, that Drs. Perales and Lee uh, just spoke to you about. And so I'm going to sort of give you my take on the, the current status of the data and how I make choices in uh, all of the settings, uh, both prevention and treatment of advanced acute and chronic graft versus host disease. So in terms of selection of GVHD prophylaxis, this is how I am thinking about things these days. And I, I will say that this is my approach and not necessarily shared by even other investigators at my center, but um, there is some rationale behind it. So if one looks in the setting of reduced intensity transplantation or in any setting with a haploidentical donor, I really think we have very obvious data in front of us. We should be using a PTSI-based uh, prevention strategy, but uh, clinical trials remain uh, extremely important in both of these settings. There is certainly room to improve upon the current platform of PTSI, and so I think it's very reasonable still to be enrolling our patients in clinical trials in this setting. And as you've heard, uh, what should we be looking at? Well, novel pharmacologic agents, those uh, studies that examine graft manipulation strategies, perhaps ATG, and new ways of uh, delivering post-transplant cyclophosphamide, either with novel agents or changing the dose or timing of PT site. And I think uh, this is where uh, the field stands. In the myeloablative setting, one has to consider the fact that we have a couple of different approaches and we do need to separate our patients out. In patients who have mismatched unrelated donors, uh, I think either the approach of using a Batacept in combination with a calcineurin inhibitor or the use of a PTSI-based transplant is very reasonable. These have not been compared head-to-head except in uh, retrospective analyses, but I think one can make a reasonable choice here. There is uh, currently active clinical trials in uh, both of these spaces, both the Abatacept, the APA3 study, and multiple PTCI-based uh, trials. In fully matched myeloblative, either related or unrelated donor transplantation, we do have to still say that the standard of care today is a calcineurin and methotrexate-based uh, uh, prevention based on the trial that Dr. Perales just showed you, which was essentially a negative study uh, with the caveat that PTSI in that trial was used in the absence of a calcineurin and MMF, sort of the standard regimen that most of us deliver PTSI with. There are some, several considerations here. So if you are going to use a standard calcineurin methotrexate backbone, then one needs to think about using marrow when possible. Also using a Batacept, it is approved in the 8 of 8 setting and does improve outcomes. And I would draw your attention to the late-breaking abstract uh, that will be uh, delivered by Dr. Chen from uh, Mass General on Saturday. Of course, clinical trials remain the mainstay here. We uh, are not yet done in terms of preventing acute graft versus host disease in the myeloblative setting and uh, several different strategies, trials that examine uh, both acute GVHD and chronic GVHD prevention, really looking at the same, uh, the same strategies as in the reduced intensity setting. So what about therapy of steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease? So here we also have multiple options. So right up front, we know, based on what Dr. Perales told us, that ruxolitinib is FDA approved in steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease. It is the only compound approved in this setting. However, we do have to remember that in the REACH study, the rate of complete response or CR among patients with steroid refractory grade three or grade four GVHD was only about 25%. And I don't think any of us feel that that is really sufficient for this very high risk group of, of patients. Uh, 
In addition, in that study, there was no overall survival advantage for patients who received ruxolitinib over best available care. And so for that reason, I would actually stay that uh, clinical trials really are the mainstay for steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease. So for your patients who enroll on a clinical trial for their first steroid refractory uh, disease, um, you do have to think about the other supportive measures that you're going to be delivering when you are treating them, either on a clinical trial or not. And so things like uh, nutritional support, complete bowel rest, looking at antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal prophylaxis, and doing all of these things to maximize outcomes. We don't know how long patients should stay on their frontline therapy for uh, steroid refractory acute GVHD. Many of the studies suggest treatment courses as short as three to seven days before moving on to the next agent, but we know that uh, organs such as the GI tract simply take time to recover and to function normally. And so one has to be very careful about moving from drug to drug to drug uh, because what we end up doing is over immunosuppress our patients who might be destined to respond to the first line therapy that you've given them. So if one uh, does deliver a clinical trial and that is unsuccessful, choices at that time include moving over to ruxolitinib, which is the standard of care there, a second clinical trial, or using any one of those agents uh, that we would consider best available care, and I would refer you back to the uh, table that Dr. Perales showed, showing multiple drugs that are possible in that scenario. If your patient had ruxolitinib as first-line steroid refractory disease, it does leave you with a one fewer option, you can't go to ruxolitinib again, but clinical trials or best available care remain the mainstay there. How do you think about what uh, agent to move on to? Well, of course, looking at cumulative toxicity, the potential toxicity of the agent you're thinking about choosing, and uh, things like uh, immunosuppression and uh, the, uh, the infectious complications that you're dealing with might uh, help decide which agent you should be moving on to next. And so the agents that we have to choose from are drugs that are very broadly immunosuppressive in this setting, like ATG or CAMPATH, those that work through alternative mechanisms of action, ECP, perhaps alpha-1 antitrypsin. You can then move to agents that target individual cytokines or individual uh, pathways, uh, depending on your choice at that time. Uh, this is now going to get a little bit controversial, but if your patient then continues to progress beyond second line and now you're into your third drug, we really are in a, in a, a obviously a bad spot for your patient, and you have choices here as well, uh, either clinical trials or best available care, again, switching agents, classes, or something with non-overlapping toxicity. But the one consideration I would think uh, is is worth mentioning at this point in the late stage of this game is that we have tested many drugs in the very, very late steroid refractory acute GVHD setting, and the drugs have uniformly failed here because our patients are extraordinarily ill, and uh, it is quite possible that we have abandoned uh, immunosuppressive and active agents because we've tested them in a patient population that we simply cannot uh, cannot um, improve. And so I would argue that we should be testing our novel and potentially good agents in the upfront setting in steroid refractory disease so that we don't uh, sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. Uh, finally, in steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease, as you just heard from Dr. Lee, we do have a number of choices. This is uh, how I choose among the three FDA-approved agents in this setting, uh, initially taking toxicity into consideration. So patients who have pre-existing cytopenias, I would avoid ruxolitinib. Those with cardiac issues or diarrhea, I tend to avoid abrutinib. And those with high uh, liver function tests, I avoid belumosidil because those patients were not included in the uh, KDO25, 208, or 213 trials. 
I do sometimes take what prior malignancy the patient had into consideration. So for patients who had a prior B cell malignancy, I will often reach for a brutinib, thinking that it might provide uh, just a bit of post-transplant maintenance. And for those patients who had JAK2 positive malignancies, I will often choose uh, ruxolitinib or another JAK inhibitor uh, in that setting. In terms of the characteristics of the GVHD, I do make choices uh, there. So for patients with advanced lung disease or advanced fibrosis, I reach for belumosidil more frequently because of its mechanism of action uh, with antifibrotic properties. Uh, for those patients who did not respond to rituximab, which I sometimes still administer, I would avoid uh, ibrutinib in that setting because that would be a second drug targeting the B-cell pathway. And then finally, in pediatrics, as you've heard, uh, there are dedicated pediatric studies now in all three, uh, with all three agents, with the brutinib and ruxolitinib, I believe, REACH-4 study that has been, uh, uh, been shown in abstract format, and an ongoing uh, pediatric study with belumosidil, but the brutinib and ruxolitinib data are more mature and therefore are perhaps better choices in uh, steroid refractory chronic GVHD in pediatrics. So with that, we are uh, at the end of our hour. So with that, uh, I think it's time that we uh, thank Peerview for putting this together, thanking all of our sponsors, Drs. Perales and Lee. Thank you all very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CJR860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, CSL Bearing, Insight Corporation, Pharmacyclics LLC, an AbV company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC, Malincrot Pharmaceuticals, and Orca Bio.